So at this point, when you are wowed by all three of those things, all the costumes, the set, and the makeup, realize at this point, thousands of man hours have been put into this production already. It's now our responsibility. If we screw it up, it's our fault. It's not their fault. What they've done is going, you're gonna see how glorious it actually is. There are a lot of stories I could tell about this film, about the making of this film. I could tell one about each and every person that worked on the production. And that's what this video is about. It's about them. It's for them. Especially the behind the scenes folks. Um, a lot of times they don't get any of the um, recognition for what they did because everybody sees the actual picture and what's in front of the camera, but not many people get to really really see what it's like behind the camera not just for the cinematographer and the director but the production team the gaffer the grip craft services team the catering the line manager the producers all that stuff the makeup team the costumers the team that we had on this production is probably the best cohesive team i've ever worked with i think the resulting product shows that in the quality of how it looks um, on screen and how it comes across and everything about the production. Yeah, we had a limited budget. There was a lot of things that probably we would have liked to do that because of budget constraints, they weren't gonna happen and we had to find creative ways to work around that. But I think we were immensely successful. So much so that the film actually got picked up for distribution. We made the film at that point, I was assuming that that was going to be it. And then we started getting calls from distribution companies. But the team that was involved in making the film, everybody involved, it wouldn't have been picked up like that if these people hadn't given everything that they gave to make it look like what it does. So, uh, it's, it means a lot to me what these people did. The way I got involved with this project is a uh, butterfly effect, like one little tiny thing that you do that ends up completely changing your life or the course of your life. So I befriended Jill a while ago, back in 2015. You know, we were friends on Facebook and one day I saw her post this picture of Rebecca in her full buttercup outfit. In the description, it said that it was for, it was a makeup that she did for a movie. And I was like, whoa, that's cool. Um, hey, so if you need a special effects artist or a prop maker or anything, hit me up. When I think about pre-production, I, I am transported back to this moment where Michael mentioned to me, hey, I'm going to do a feature film. And having worked with Michael on a few shorts, I was like, I, I want in. I think the most memorable part of the process was when I got cast as Whisper, because originally I had auditioned for Kaylee, and I didn't even see the sides for Whisper. I didn't even know about Whisper's character or anything. Speaking as your squad mate, how you die matters more than why you die. Anyway, when you go, it'll probably be as a fat old man surrounded by a gaggle of grandchildren. They'll have to roll you into your grave. My experience of being cast in Broken Swords was very different than everyone else's. I originally read for Kaylee months and months before production started. Your goddess. Won't she be jealous if you flirt with the affections of another god? She is fickle, but no. She favors the warrior born. She may not always mend our wounds, but it's her river that takes us to the sword halls. All she cares about is the appropriate respect. Rebecca, who plays Buttercup, had contacted me about this movie that uh, Michael was directing, she said, you've got to talk to him because he really needs a props person. And I had worked with her. She directed many shows that I worked on props for her. And so I contacted Michael and he was really happy that I was really interested in working on this movie. And when I told him what my experience was and what I liked doing, he was excited and I was very excited. So he hired me and everything was wonderful. So when I got the script and, you know, from hiring, you know, basically just diving in deep to learning more about my character, learning more about this world that we lived in. I remember uh, I went on a vacation and I literally just like brought my script with me on the beach and just sat there and just like went through and had like this lovely day, just like sitting there and like percolating on that. It was such a cool opportunity 
opportunity to just be a part of this world that had been created. We had an actor drop out two days or the day before, two days before, um, and we were able to get a replacement up from Atlanta. Two days before production started, I get a phone call and it is Michael Babbitt. He's saying, hi, Karina, this is Michael Pavitt. Uh, I was wondering if you might be able to come play this role in Broken Swords. It's not the role you originally read for. It's Hobnail. And I said, OK. <laughs> I said, let's do it. It was definitely like a roller coaster ride. I remember, because I went and auditioned for your first film. And, and I, and here's a bad actor confession. I admit when I came to the, the call back late because I got my time wrong and I never get my time wrong ever as an actor. I've never, never been late to an audition ever. So, so I went to that late and, you know, went through the whole thing and all I kept thinking was, he's never going to cast me. He's not going to cast somebody that doesn't show up on time. And I'm like, he's military. He went to UNC. So then when you call me out of nowhere, you're like, Hey, I want you, I want you to be in this film. I'm like, Really? <laughs> My involvement with the film was, in my own opinion, quite accidental. <laughs> in college, I actually met our director, Michael Babbitt. Michael was directing um, two back-to-back -back Shakespeare shows, and he ended up casting me in that. I actually helped with some of the costuming. That's what I learned that I really liked, was actually more behind the scenes. Working on a film of this genre, you know, like the fantasy genre, where pretty much everything goes, that was really, really enticing, honestly. I remember some of the first conversations with Michael and just really quickly realizing, like, man, this guy's got such great vision, but he's just, he's gonna kind of like let us do our thing. So the whole thing just seemed to be like such a collaborative effort, but like, but at the same time, like we were never like stuck, like trying to figure out like, what does this guy want? Cause he gave us such great direction. My story of becoming a part of the Broken Swords family is a strange one. Uh, I started off by uh, just reaching out to Michael through IMDB because uh, one of the tactics I had been using at the time when trying to find projects was I'd scour IMDB Pro for projects that were either in development or pre-production. And that's why I, I came across Broken Swords, then titled The Last in Line that way, and reached out to Michael and I was like, hey, you know, I'm really interested in this project. I'd love to be a part of it uh, if you don't have a DP attached. And much like many other of the, these projects I reached out to, Michael's response was, uh, hey, thanks for reaching out. We actually currently do have a DP attached, you know, but uh, I'll keep your name on file. So fast forward a couple of decades, which is also interesting because I stayed in touch with Michael. I joined a um, short film production club. It was called Group 101. It was a trio. It was myself, um, a woman named uh, Kim Evans, and another woman named Agnes Jasinska. Well, Agnes moved to Chicago. While all that was going on, we ended up being pulled into a feature-length production from another person who was involved in Group 101. So we ended up being associate producers of that film. I'm actually a consultant for a living, which actually means I babysit adults. <laughs> being, being a producer and being a line producer is really kind of the same thing. So Michael asked if I would be willing to help on his production. And I said, yeah, absolutely. I'd be happy to do it. And then some months later, uh, I reached out to Michael again. I followed up with him. I was like, hey, I know you're getting ready to go into production. Uh, best of luck to you. I want to make sure everything was still ship shaped the way we had last left it. And I got an email back from Michael saying, hey, as a matter of fact, here's the deal. We lost our DP. And would you be interested in, in talking about it? And it's, you know, it's so funny that you reached out to me now uh, because this all just happened. It's almost set, sounds like a setup for like a... Uh, conspiracy film where it's like, you know, I found a way to knock off the previous DP just so I could get the job. So the way that I started working on the project was I, I'd just been hired at Over It. I came in like, oh, I'm going to work on, I'm work with, you know, bands or whatever, or like, you know, do a variety of things and then and boom, magic spells. It won't last long. You're doing magic spells. I was like, all right, this is going to be cool. 
it was just something that he kind of offhand mentioned. And I thought, I, you know, I don't care what he asks me to do. I will do it. I would, I would have, I would have done whatever just to be on the set and, and just to be a part of it. Um, so when Michael mentioned Buttercup, I was just over the moon. I said, and this is even more fantastic because the film's really awesome. It's like this whole Dungeons and Dragons theme thing. This has been this has been like my dream role forever because I've seen fantasy films come and go, and nine out of ten times they never get made because people realize there's no way we can do this. We don't have the budget. We can't get the equipment, the the armor, the everything, monsters, the whole nine yards. So most of these things cave or you just never see them, period. Or they're just super big budgets and you have to live in LA and have an awesome agent. And then a couple months later, I was in the gym and I got a phone call from you and it, you were just like, so I have a different role that I feel like you could fit well in. And I read for Whisper and I was just like, oh, this is why the other one didn't work out. Like I have to be Whisper, I love Whisper. I was really happy to say yes because I knew that this was one of Michael's dreams that he wanted to make a feature length film. And that had been something that he had talked about a lot of the time I'd known him. And I think when um, your friends ask you to help them accomplish their dream, particularly if it's something you can actually help them with, that you should. The day to day of production, starting at oh dark 30 in the morning <laughs> to get up here and the ending at oh dark at night was that was that was a challenge managing talent was the one of the difficulty things because there's just so many different personalities and it was a large cast there was you know large cast and a very small space especially the scenes when everybody was in the most challenging thing about making a film is understanding that there is a, a plan for filming anything. The director and the production staff have built that. What is challenging is making sure everyone agrees to the plan, understands what the plan is, and why it's being executed this way. Because lots of folks like to think that plans should be changed for them. <laughs> and there's lots of reasons for that. And, and, and that's that's not a wrong or a right or a good or a bad. I loved it. I loved every minute of it. I'm glad I just, instead of tip, dipping my toe in, I just, just went for it. And it created such a cool atmosphere. And it was tough. It was hard. It would be a lie if I didn't say it was hard. Definitely one of the hardest things I've ever done. Well, we had another sound designer who was working on real sound effects, maybe what we'd call like hard sound effects. So swords and, you know, things clinking around, arrows and like, you know, footsteps and things like that. But my job was the stuff that was like, this stuff doesn't exist in the real world. So what does it sound like? What does a berserker spell sound like in real life? I don't know. I guess I have to make that up. I had to still do physical warm-ups, vocal warm-ups every day, but they were kind of truncated by the schedule. And that's another challenge of filming, was actually trying to get used to the schedule, whether it be early mornings, late nights. I think another challenge was always being on time each time, which, not to speak for anything else, anybody else, I was good. I was there every time I had a film. The hard part was knowing where we were each time. The most challenging part for me was actually the weather. Um, when we first got there, it was really beautiful, but it was a little muggy, but the costumes are so heavy and there's just like head to toe and I have this appliance on my chest. So it's like already my like neck and chest are warm and I'm like seeping sweat up into this appliance now. And then I have this cape and I have this corset, but then the makeup would be melting and we'd have to stop to touch it up or the blood would start dripping down your face or the appliance would start lifting and then we'd have to touch that up. So it was like, it made things tedious. And then week two, the temperature just plummeted and it went down, I think you said like 25 degrees. I remember like the last, the last day, um, 
trying to keep everybody there, but it was cold and there wasn't enough room in the tent where Sherry was and they had a heat. We had a heater there for them, I think. At some point, I think we both relented and let them stay up here. But if we walk you up to it, you better be on your way down <laughs> like five seconds before I actually pushed the button. One of the biggest challenges that I had as a producer was making sure that I could provide housing for everyone. Uh, that entailed almost 30 people having places to stay. And so one of the things that we did was we took one of the buildings on the property, the house, and cleared out all the non-essential furniture. I had the pleasure of having Steve, Diana, and Brian Hicks help put futons in the house and replace a lot of the furniture so that we would have something for our uh, crew to sleep on at night and places for everybody to sit during the day. We had most of the futons put back together and then we had one we just could not figure out. And Brian, our teenager, was the one that managed to get that one together. We had a lot of the crew uh, sleeping in the house. They started their day really early and ended it late, so it was helpful for them to not have to travel. Every night, um, the production sometimes went a little longer, and sometimes we would finish at 10.30, sometimes we'd finish at 11, sometimes we'd finish at, at, at 12. You know, and, and production, you have to stay there, gather up all the equipment for the day, put it away. You know, we'd have to prepare everything for the next day. I, I went home and I really wish that I would have stayed there. I was like dying to go back the next day. It's like, okay, counting the hours. So I would get home and, you know, I, sometimes I would get home at one and then wake up at four. And then, you know, I'd be in the car by um, five for another day. And I was always anticipating. I, I just wish I would have just stayed there and not gone anywhere. <laughs> one of the biggest challenges that I knew I would be facing going in is, this is a world that doesn't have electricity. In preparation for the film, I, I did watch a number of period pieces from like either Victorian age or Civil War era uh, stuff. Um, and it's also a world that's, it's nighttime. You know, we had a lot of mimicked uh, lights using uh, you know, little flickering LED candle lights or things like that. How do you light a world that has no electricity? Unfortunately, Shane drew the short straw and Shane spent all 15 days of production, and I'm sure there's plenty of behind the scenes of this, uh, with the lantern lock, which was basically a china ball with the bulb inside, and it was on a, its own little dimmer. So Shane and I had a conversation when Shane was mostly asleep, and I was letting him know what we were having for breakfast, and Shane's response was, it's hot and you're making it, it'll be good. <laughs> Yeah, I came some late nights to to watch everybody what everyone was doing, and it was it was amazing to see Shane and Sean working their magic with the lighting and seeing how they arranged things to look good in the shot. To and it just it just was one of the coolest things I've ever seen. Got to give credit to Shane. He kept he kept me he kept me sane a couple times. Shane was my was my bunkmate or my roommate during uh uh during the shoots uh he was uh he was the key grip he honestly i think became like almost my my right hand man at times during that production and like if if i was busy with something else i could rely on him to switch out something or run a run a battery down to set or whatever needed to be done he was more than willing to do it so sean schaefer and, and jake um uh Sean being the DP and, and Jake the uh, AD. I mean, those guys were just the dream team. Sean just had such great vision. Every time he put the camera and set the lights, it was just like gold. It's like, oh, that looks really good. Because again, I was doing the, the photography on the side. And on-set photography, the beauty of on-set photography is I don't have to do shit because it's already set up for me. The, the shot's set up, the lights are set up. I'm just clicking a picture, stealing, stealing the DP shot, essentially. So my my on-set photography looked awesome because Sean set it up and made it look awesome, you know? But it, you know, every shot on, on the film looks great. It's just like this cinematic quality that for an independent film was bar none. We always had one source to raise the overall exposure table. Um, and then poor Shane 
with his lantern lock, a uh, source of motivated light. So we always had to play, okay, in this scene, where is our candlelight being motivated from? Okay, Shane, that's where you're going to be. And the places that we stuck Shane, I'm glad he's so small and malleable and, and you know, almost contortionist-like because we stuck him in some, some weird places. Committing to where light sources were going to come from in coordination with what you see on screen. So the idea is like, yeah, we see all these little LED flicker lights around the room, so we have to motivate our light coming from there. And since most of those don't move, the light, there has to be light coming from there almost at all times. So maintaining that aesthetic of a candle lit room and deceiving the audience into thinking that it's entirely lit by these, by these candles or by these sources is probably, was probably the biggest challenge. With, with the cinematography, I, I loved how, I've never been on a set before where someone was that advanced with the camera or in the, you know, obviously the pro realm, of course, with what he, things he would suggest, what he would, what he would bring to the table, how he would just be able to easily weave in and out of the shots. And that's why it looked very beautiful. The aesthetic that we went for wanted to always feel like it was alive, that it was breathing, that we are, we are in the thick of it, in the trenches with the broken swords. And so the entire film, save for I think two shots, um, is shoulder mounted or handheld. Now as a cinematographer, now not only am I composing a shot and lighting a shot and working with Michael to block out the shot, but now I'm a, an active part of the dance. You'll notice a lot of scenes in the film where the camera is, is, is moving and, and almost, like I said, dancing with the talent on screen you know, but, but being there and being a part of it and maintaining the, the shot composition um, and not seeing lights and not seeing other things all becomes part of everything that's going on in, in my head and in front of my eye. And thankfully, uh, Jake, my first AC on the film, was as good as, as he is at his job because he's in another room entirely uh, wirelessly pulling the focus off of, off of his monitors. I think the simplest thing to say about Sean is that he has an incredible eye and, and how he sees things through the lens of Falcor, <laughs> his pet camera, <laughs> who has a name, was really amazing. And watching Jake Shapiro and Sean work together, they had a wonderful simpatico, but they shared an aesthetic and it, was really amazing how the two of them worked with Michael Babbitt, our director, and presented an entire vision that was, I hate to use the word pretty because it's a story about mercenaries. You would never, ever, ever in your wildest dreams look at this and go, oh, they built that over a few months in Michael's backyard. That's not what it looks like. It's so amazingly good. It's beautiful. The way you have success is by having trust in your partner. And the dance that myself and Jake and Michael all had going on set was to trust in, in one another. Now, a lot of times in certain scenes, Michael is on camera. He can watch a playback, but that starts to eat into the day. So he has to have trust in us as his dance partners in this production, just as much as I have to have trust in Jake that it'll be in focus and that he has to have trust in me that I'm not going to step left when I should have stepped right or completely blow the blocking moving with the talent. You know, we wanted to hit on all cylinders for the entirety of the 90 minutes that you're watching the film. Having trust in your dance partners like that in a production like this was vital to the film's success in getting done on time and looking the way that it that it does because if we had just accepted okay we would not have had the the same film that we we have much to the credit of my two two dance partners through the production uh michael and jake anytime i enter a project what is most important to me is that i feel like i can do the character justice i have never been a soldier so before we got to the set, I did a lot of research. I did a lot of reading. I interviewed people who have been in the services. 
I'd actually gotten a, a fight choreographer friend of mine to work with me on the, the holding the sword and the shield and how you do that. One of the gifts that Michael really gave to each of us actors was his openness and his availability and his interests. He was eager always to talk about character, to make sure that any questions that we had, uh, you know, that we were thinking through stuff, that we were really figuring out who these characters were. And, um, and I just had a ton of conversations with Michael about who Buttercup was. He had a really great grasp of this character and connecting her to me in a way. And I, I felt like it was really just a huge gift to me as an actor to have that kind of attention just on my character. Props to Michael Babbitt for, for just doing like this, taking on directing, acting, and like everything, <laughs> being a producer, being in charge, like trying to do all that on a film of this size. You know as an actor, you know what a huge task, what a mountainous task that is. But then to come on set and like be so like rock solid on your lines and just in the character and I'm just like, like he, he's the leader. He's our epic leader of all time. <laughs> like, like only Michael can pull this off. I don't know how he's doing it. But Michael is uh, very prepared, very, very prepared in the pre-production stage to do as much as possible to pre-visualize the film. I mean, right down to the, to the wardrobe and the sets and props and everything. And um, we were very blessed to have equally passionate people in all of those departments to take that vision, that very vivid vision put before us and kind of run with it. So um, it made my job as a cinematographer easier because it's just unfortunately a, a, an aspect of non-union and in independent film that typically a professional's vision isn't there. And, and Michael was a true professional through and through in, in getting us all prepared to help bring his vision to, to the screen. One scene in particular stands out is when I am, when DJ, me, is talking to Whisper about his history and his father and his, why he's named what he is and what he's proving, what he needs in the scene, what he wants. My full name is Duveth Jarnas. <laughs> My father is a fifefolder sworn to the Lord of Serenia. Duveth is a whore's name. He's also an arrogant son of a bitch who never wasted an opportunity to tell me how worthless I was. I actually work specifically with the director on this, with bringing my own history, some, some personalization into it. I remember the director saying to me each time, he's like, Gio, all you're doing is just put it on her, put it on him, put it on her. Keep, you know, putting it out and not in. Um, really took off a lot of pressure and allowed the work to flow. So the environment, the, 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 the setting, the, the, the pre-work and the, the, the angst that I think that came with it finally um, bubbled up to something very nice, very uh, beautiful, according to uh, the director. So production was very interesting for me because I did have a full idea about the script and where we were going and, and the arc of the storyline, but I wasn't nearly as prepared as everyone else had been who had had all this time to the point where I remember the first group scene that we shot. Everyone was so in character and it was so well done that we're outside doing a read through before going in and filming. And I broke character and laughed because, wait, that was actually the real line. <laughs> and so it was a really interesting experience for me that I just, there was this whole world created that I just, got tossed into. I loved the project. I loved being a part of it. I loved everyone that I got a chance to spend time with. I'm so proud of everyone who put so much time, work, and effort into making it the beautiful work that it is. I'm still like Broken Swords forever, and that's never going to change. There was a fun moment for me. The uh, end of the movie is very exciting. Everybody's all together. And they go running out this door. And they're running into the darkness. Because at this point in time, it actually had gotten late. Um, so I was sitting crouched outside of the door with somebody over my head pulling it open. And I was shining a flashlight out into the uh, darkness so that the actors could safely know where to run. So I got, I got to be in that moment. I think it was a solid 
two weeks, I think, a, week, a two week period where we filmed. And yeah, I looked forward to coming in and seeing who was gonna be there that day and who I was gonna eat with. And it was like a family reunion kind of every day. And we also got to act. An amazing set with amazing costumes and props and special effects. I think we spent like almost two months animate like designing and animating the wall breaker and the samada army and they're only on screen for 11 seconds all right michael wanted it to be huge and kind of like an ogre or, or a troll almost but like more beastly and i wanted to incorporate this one design that i'd had in my head for ages it was the head of a pachycephalosaurus which is a dinosaur that has like a big dome on its head and kind of like a menacing beak and large eyes and it would like charge into things and bash them with its skull. I remember one thing that he wanted in there was he, want, he wanted to give it some character. He suggested like when it's walking out of the forest, it should like be scratching its armpit or something. Well, I mean, you know, we had to keep on coming back with really great sound design. You know, like every creature, every magic spell had to be a little better than the last. And, you know, we're sort of imagining this realm, this land that, you know, doesn't exist in, in real life, you know? Um, but there's, it exists in Michael's brain, you know? I, I, I did an awful lot of taking things, taking sounds that weren't, it wouldn't be used in the way that I ended up using them. So I'd take sounds and turn them into something they are totally not. So, uh, like lots of stuff. I, I mean, I threw ridiculous nonsense into my computer and manipulated it, you know, until it was just utterly unrecognizable. So one of the things, the really obscure things to bring up is the thumper arrows. There was like a reverb tail that happened right after it hit and or went off. It was like, boom, whoosh, and there's a whoosh. And that whoosh actually came from just ripping a piece of paper. When we were down to mix days and Michael came into the studio, it was, you know, myself, a re-recording mixer, Nathaniel Reichman, and uh, Dave Parker was here, one of our sound designers. And, and Michael came in and just had uh, a huge smile on his face. You know, sitting through the final mix that I really didn't have anything to do with, but just kind of seeing everything come together. Um, because I'd done a lot of stuff in the studio before, all music related and things like that, um, but not, never really worked in a movie. So kind of seeing the whole thing come together um, was, was, was pretty cool. It was, it's nothing can be more rewarding than spending several weeks, in this case, I want to say, probably a couple months on, on a project and you're really diving in and really investing yourself. And the person whose baby you've been kind of like, you know, helping grow comes in and is genuinely like, you know, just ecstatic, you know, like th those are the moments that like you can't buy. I do not deal well with gore. Four, five, six. Team one, take three, seven slash nine, take one. Three, take two, soft sticks. <laughs> I'm not talking about Tom Gore. He's fine. I'm um, talking about blood and gore. There's a scene in the film. Someone gets injured and a buttercup is right there. It's written so that this person is like bleeding out of their mouth. Like, I know it's not real blood. I know this person is going to get up after the scene and walk back and like wash off and stuff like that. But it's the fact that I have to be there while this is happening. So we get in there and this, this actor has to have the um, blood in their mouth and deliver and they're lying on their back okay so that's tricky they had to deliver lines it was so funny and i was like i can't you know like i had to work really hard really hard to not just dissolve in laugh because it was so absurd and i'm thinking i'm like this poor person i don't think i could do this and what he was going through i guess it's like isn't it um sean freuda when you're like finding humor in someone else's pain and discomfort. I don't know, maybe that's what it was, but it was hysterical to me. The production team of Broken Swords is, <laughs> they're magic, they're absolute magic. The, the costumes and the makeup are two specifically that I don't think I would have ever truly been able to 
get into the world or get into character without those two things. Um, when it came to the makeup, Jill and Ariana and Alex were fantastic. They started with people at O Dark 30 and they weren't done with people sometimes until noon. And, and it was braiding and matting and bloodying and bruising. And this scene today means that someone has to have this wound. So let's make sure that we make you look like you need to look when you get to set, but we have to do it around the fact that we have to braid her hair 7,000 different ways. They were a really interesting and imaginative group of people. And they really did a great job of helping the actors inhabit their roles. Every morning I would wake up at like set six or seven, no, 6.30 I think is when we would start getting up. But weird thing was I actually wasn't that tired. I was energized for the whole production. Like even on days when it was really hard, I was still excited because this is, we're making a movie, it's great. <laughs> this is what I've always wanted to do ever since I saw Lord of the Rings. So I was sleeping on a pullout bed and I'd get up every morning at 6.30 and just start getting to work. So we'd just like basically go through a little brief morning routine, get people in their chairs, get the makeup set up, and just try and get them finished and in costume before, I think we'd start at like 7 or 8 when we'd start, what was it, 9? Maybe it was 9 when we'd start sending them out. But yeah, we some days we'd have only you know three people that we had to get ready, other days we'd have the whole cast. After about day two, Ariana became kind of the one person who did my makeup every day. It was an ordeal. It was a really, really long, it wasn't difficult, it was just long. I would be called first at 6 a.m. Um, on the days that I was shooting, and I would sit in the chair, and after 45 minutes, and three other people had gone through the other chair, I was still there, and we had only had like base makeup on. It was, we had to do the nails, we had to do all the base makeup. We had to do the prosthetics on my face to the point where in the middle of the night, I would wake up and I would find myself like half asleep and like feeling for the prosthetics to see if they were stuck, count them. I would go one, two, three, I would go one, two, three, because I would do that all day on set to make sure that they were still there, that I hadn't knocked one off. Ariana has this calming presence, so being in the makeup chair with her was peaceful. Yeah, it was very zen, right? Jill has this creative energy that is kind of inspiring, you know? And then there's Alex, who is this awesome, quirky dude who is just the gentlest spirit, but he's like making the nastiest stuff. Say, first of all, that, um... I need to give props to everybody, give props to props and props to world building and set. Um, in particular, I am a big sci-fi fantasy nerd. I was drawn into the intricate work of the, the, um, the heads, the Samada heads, uh, the Nosk imagery, the prosthetics that uh, SFX makeup did. All right, honestly, I really enjoyed the Samada head. That was. I was super excited for that one, like making that. I, that's why when I would go home, I would sketch out designs and things for it. Whenever I had free time, I kept coming up with, like it went, I went a little overboard with it. I, I started researching like cross sections and necks cause I wanted that part to get, to be right. I went really deep into the research. I learned hair punching. I learned how to work with silicone. I learned, I actually made a skull for it, like an internal structure, and I made it so the eyes would be removable and then you could put them back in. <sighs> That's not how it works. I think what you want to do is hold, is, yeah. this, is it like this? Yeah, you gotta like that. Okay. There you go. Nice. So Amory and the costuming was another thing that just blew me. No, I don't think it just blew me away. I think they blew everyone away. How detailed and how just good they looked. They just look good. <laughs> I kind of feel like Anne Marie deals with props the way actors research, you know, character development and 
and and think about motivation. She puts so much thought into everything that she touches. And we had the gift uh, on this production of her uh, not only doing props, but also working on the costumes. After I had created my props, after I had completed work on each costume and having each actor put on their costume and hold their props, you could see their whole character all of a sudden come alive and actually inhabit that space because I've given them the tools to enhance their performance. You know, she immediately took me over to the costume, told me exactly like, Everything she did from like head to toe is like as far as what she how she made things and put things together and even with the tattoos because she had she helped come up with all the Celtic symbols and stuff like that and that the tattoos actually said things. I was very honored when Michael asked me to embellish Marco's armor and I make jewelry called Oyams that have the Oyam language on it. It's a pre-Celtic, pre-Druid language, and it symbolizes the growing tree with its branches. I was able to put Oyams on his armor, on his helmet, and on his armbands. That made me feel like there was a little piece of me on set all the time. Whenever I see Marco, I see those Oyams. I think about all the little vials and all the special things that Hobnail had. And I remember when Karina was um, like really like getting the finishing touches on her costume and just like exploring. And it was all so exciting. And I remember all of us were really excited to see what we had in our, our hutches. After being in the chair for about an hour, I would then have to go to costumes. Anne Marie because of the fake nails, she would have to help me into most of my costume. She had to put my shoes on for me. She would have to, I mean, the only thing I could pretty much get on myself was like the, was the top and the shawl. The costumes were so, so personalized and every little detail was so specific. I had the two, um, two animal felts on me and I named them. It was Lester and Little Dude. <laughs> Our prop master, Anne Marie, always had, uh, she was really thoughtful in the way that she would just like add a little element of your character, like a little piece for everyone um, in their little like pouch hutch thing. I had to create props and the look of costumes for an off-world place that I'd never been to, and since I'm not someone who does fantasy games and role playing and cosplay, any of that, this was all brand new to me. It had to be different enough to create something that nobody else had seen yet look authentic and look like it really did belong in that place. Todd, he was fantastic in that he does a lot of uh, sword fighting and medieval reenactment type things that he showed me where an, a soldier would be hitting another soldier. And he placed those just perfectly so that I knew then how to distress that area to make it look like it had done some damage. I got involved via Anne-Marie, who is the uh, props designer and then costume designer. She had, I was at her house for a barbecue and she said, hey, I'm working on this movie and I've got these boxes of costumes and armor and I don't know what bits go with what and I know you do medieval recreation, can you help? What was a lot of fun was taking out each one of these costumes out into my backyard, my husband laying out the tarps on the ground and we put each costume, laid it out as if somebody was wearing them and look at them from a distance and see, okay, does this costume look complete? And I think if anybody would have walked into my backyard, they would have thought, okay, who did she just kill? So we spent the next, oh, probably two, three weekends beating up armor with sticks and pry bars and <laughs> wonder bars and figuring out, okay, who's left-handed, who's right-handed? Todd, the armorer, was banging on the air armor and cutting different pieces of fabric 
that was part of the costume. And we took a video of that and shared it with a bunch of our friends that are in the Irish Penny Brigade. And them looking at that video, seeing where Todd was hitting the armor, they're going, yep, yeah, that's right, that's good. One of the really interesting things for me was seeing how the armor all came together. So I picked Dante, who played top up at the airport, and took him to the costumer's house where she had all the armor laid out and watched Todd, our armor, start to fit it on him. And this is a lot more complicated than you would think. All of the buckles, all of the pieces, the way it needs to hang, it was quite fascinating to watch him uh, put the armor and put it together on top and make sure that it fit him perfectly for the production. One thing that I am so thankful for are the friends that I have that were so willing to just drop anything and come in and help me with the costumes. Um, two people in particular is Lily Younger. She came in and she has worked with medieval costumes a lot. And she took the judge's corset and with a very fine, tiny little paintbrush, she was painting all of the little curlicues on that corset in a copper color. And she was so meticulous, making sure that every little line was absolutely perfect. And because she has worked with um, different medieval fairs, she knew how they should look, um, what type of dirt should be on them, and where the dirt should be. One particular afternoon, Renee, a uh, neighbor friend of mine, came over, and she's done a lot of costuming. When Renee was out on the porch, she was wrapped up in a towel, completely bare from the chest on up, and it was bitterly cold out there. She had some prosthetics put along her neck and on her face so that when you see Whisper in the movie and you see the gouging and the blood and the wrinkled skin, that was Renee sitting out in the cold, getting those moles put on her, and then we were painting afterwards on the, the different blood wounds and scarring. She's also helped on many of the sword recommendations for me, but that particular item, she was fantastic. She was quite the trooper. Going and getting ready for the movie each day, I made sure the night before that every character had all of their costuming, their props, anything that they needed would be in an apple box <laughs> that I would pick up and label with every character's name. And with, they had little cubbies for anything that was delicate, that their character name would be on that cubby and those pieces would be there. I would check the call sheet and see what was going to be worked on for the next day so that those apple boxes were the top boxes in my special little room that I had. And one of the things I learned was how you clean costumes. So since we were shooting for 15 days, we couldn't wash them every night. We washed all the undergarments, but we couldn't wash the overgarments every night. So you spray vodka on them. You take vodka and dilute it half and half. So I'm down at the ABC store in North Carolina buying vodka, asking them for the cheapest vodka they've got because I need a lot of it to use to spray on clothing. After being involved with helping Anne Marie with costumes and the armor and getting all that taken care of. They brought me on as the armor about two weeks before production started uh, because the old armor quit. And there were a hundred and I think 140 or 160 arrows that needed to be built from scratch in those two weeks. And I made a whole bunch of arrows. Right after Jacob and I 3D printed the map pieces for him, we thought, I thought, hey, what if we did this with a Torx? That would be a lot cheaper than buying some or making them out of this stuff because I don't think I have enough pewter for all this and trying to sculpt a Torx is taking forever. And so we 3D printed them and that ended up being like a lifesaver because, oh my God. <laughs> we made some thicker ones because we printed off some thin ones and they ended up breaking a little bit, but that was fine. We used those as the Torx of the Fallen, but we made some thicker ones and all of them had unique designs to them. So you'd have different braids or you'd have beads that were worked in there. Each one was capped off with a unique piece. So every single member of the Broken Swords had their own unique torque. I think I might've gotten a little too carried away with the 3D printing 
because it gave me an excuse to be on my computer and listen to videos and just make stuff in my 3D software, which, I don't know, I find it therapeutic. Pretty much after we did the map pieces and the torques, we were like, all right, if we need anything else, we'll just 3D print it. And we ended up doing that for Switch's uh, his statue. We had it, initially, we had it rearing up just on its hind legs, and that was all that was attached to the base. But that ended up being too unstable, and it kept breaking at the ankles. I remodeled it so it would have a rock that it was standing on. And that one was a lot more structurally sound, and I still have it. So as the producer, I was bringing a lot of information and a lot of people and a lot of things together. But sometimes something wouldn't work. And when I had a problem to solve, it was a lot of fun to figure out how to solve it. And usually we had to solve it really quickly because we didn't want to slow down the production. So Anne-Marie, our costume and props uh, woman, had this amazing magic chest of spare parts. So it was this big trunk and in it she had all kinds of fabric and leather and belts and pieces. So whenever something was not available that we needed immediately, we dived into the trunk and we figured out how to put something together. So I had a chance to make a quiver when we were missing a quiver. And the way we did that was we took two soda cans or two soda bottles, big plastic ones, and cut the top and bottom off one and the top off of one, put them together with duct tape and then used material from that box. Sewed a leather outer cover and used some belts that we cut up to make the quiver that you'll see in the movie. The first day on set, he had called everybody together, and we not only had the actors there, but we had all the crew there, and he told the actors, he said, now you have to bring your A game, because look at everything Mayuki had done with the set, Laurel had done with decorating, that Sean was going to be doing with the photography and the lighting, and what I had done with the props and costumes. And that was a very proud moment for me, and I could tell that it was a very proud moment for the other crew members, too. So the first time that I walked on the set, I was driving down in Hillsboro, a very inconspicuous <laughs> little like neighborhood and really cute, just walking through the driveway. And then you see in the backyard of our director, um, you know, these two buildings that from the outside, you really don't know what's going on on the inside. So walking in and seeing that space, it just blew my mind, honestly. All the detail, the attention to detail, creating so much of a world in a space that was just like not made for that. To look at the detail from head to toe of, of the entire set was mind-boggling and breathtaking, like how much detail went into her building the walls and the ceilings, like taking those foam pieces, burning things into them, painting them, adding layers, building it and putting it together piece by piece until every inch of the set was transformed from a car garage into our set. And then all the props, especially the things inside, the baskets and everything like that, the amount of detail Muki and, and Laurel put into it, it was, it was just un unheard of. It was just like nuts. The most challenging part of this whole experience was was probably the walls. We had to use beaded styrofoam in order to create a, a look of wooden walls. And the first thing I did was take a wire brush and I scraped from top to bottom all the way down every single styrofoam sheet that we had. After that, I took a soldering pen and I created the grooves of each of the wood planks that would be um, on the walls. And then I also created some knots as well, some little details here and there as well. And after that, I took a heat gun and just kind of melted everything together to kind of fuse the styrofoam together. After that, we took some black paint and just sprayed with this huge sprayer that we had. And then after that, I took maybe four or five different shades of brown and just kind of did some wood texturing uh, painting on the styrofoam, which created this beautiful wood, but it wasn't the wood that you would expect, you know, from Earth. It was something different, and it had the sheen to it, which gave it this very otherworldly 
look to it, but still recognizable where you feel comfortable in that space. It's, it's amazing the metamorphosis that the carport and the barn both went through to specifically the barn because we used the existing structure that was already there. Um, we built walls down the middle of to separate Headshed and Abbey from, from one another. So a lot of credit needs to be given to our set design and um, set dressing departments, uh, Laurel and Miyuki. There was the tree that Laurel got and we're able to have cut into sections and rebuild it over the, um, in the entryway from one room into the next. The barrels, the, the hay bales, everything that was put in there was just so expertly done and done with care. And even just the uh, texturizing the floor to make it look like it belonged instead of the, the cement concrete floor that it actually was. It, I really think it stands out on film. I have lovely memories of set building. Um, we came and built sets um, really over a period of months. So I got to meet Miyuki Sue and Laurel Lane, who were the design concept goddesses who helped us create the reality of the world that we were building. And we did everything from paint endless pieces of styrofoam and cardboard and um, experimentation with creating wood grain um, to, you know, hammering up the walls for the sets. I had walked into this situation where we did actually create a world. We, we built a world and put a story inside of it. And I got to be a part of the team that did that. The set dressing is actually the most important, I think. Laurel was able to find lots of furniture, just little bits of details like armor that's on the walls to protect fire and candles. She found pitchforks and all these different farm equipments that would be abandoned in this barn. She found furniture and baskets. She knew exactly where to get things. We started kind of placing different items, whether it's hobnails, little area where she does her spells, um, chop shop where we knew there was going to be a lot of blood or, you know, indication of animals being chopped in that area. <laughs> but it was really Laurel. I mean, Laurel just kind of put it all together. I mean, I, I was there kind of helping and then I, you know, did the tail end of things, but Laurel was the one that just kind of went, okay, and just placed everything where they needed to go. <laughs> and it's almost like she read my mind, like she could see what was in my head. And then she just went and just started placing things everywhere. I mean, I tweaked things a little bit here and there, but otherwise Laurel just kind of went at it. And when she came out, it was perfect. <laughs> Two words that came out of my mouth first when stepping onto the set were simply, holy shit. This was handcrafted for this production by Michael and Miyuki and Laurel to be the world of the broken swords. And now it's, now I start getting like this almost like anxiety feeling of, wow, it's really on me to make sure I don't drop the ball on this when I put a camera on it because everybody worked so hard and went 150% on everything. And if I don't, and if I'm the weakest link on that, that's not where you want your weakest link to be is any department head, least of all the cinematographer who's supposed to be the guy responsible for uh, bringing the director's vision to the screen. That was both daunting and at the same time exciting because, again, typically I'm on productions where here's where we're shooting and, you know, make it look good. And, oh, by the way, you've got two hours to make it look good. Whereas on this production it was... Here's where we're shooting. We have spent a year building it to get ready for this. Can you make it look better? Because it already looked good. It already looked great. Now it was on me to make it look even better. Seeing the actors walk into the set and astonished and wowed by what 
the team had done, you know, the production team had done so far um, was very rewarding because I felt like I contributed to the work that they're going to be doing um, and hopefully get them into the mindset of being in this, the world, um, to be in character. I think the other thing that is definitely unsung is the production staff. Um, so I acted as line producer, schedule troll, head cheerleader on any given day, um, chief bottle washer. I will say the other challenge I did not mention previously was getting all the fake blood out of the showers. So Emily, our line producer, um, she was always ready and willing to throw in a hand. In fact, she was very, very often the one who was helping me with my armor. Always there, always, always ready to help in whatever way she was needed. So um, behind the scenes, we had um, the magic get it done fairies, Jane, Krista, and Diana. Everyone just took such good care of us and they were cooking, they were making us espresso, they were giving us blankets when we got cold. They were just like so supportive the whole time. It just felt like there was that little nurturing person you could always turn to and be like, I'm tired. Getting to the set, when, whenever I was able to get here and, and Diana and Jane and Emily and Krista, and th they were already up and running. Breakfast was ready. Jane was making Cuban coffee. We had a truly amazing caterer named Diana. Diana would get up early in the morning, she'd get up at 5.30 and she'd have hot breakfast, wonderful hot breakfast ready when everybody arrived at 6.30. She fixed amazing meals all throughout the production and had tons of snacks ready for everybody. I would get there at six in the morning and she would have this spread ready. It, 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 I mean, different kinds of foods and there were, you know, vegetarian foods. She covered everything. She made this French toast bake casserole type thing for breakfast that everyone I remember raving about. I'd never had something like that before. It was delicious. Um, they kept us fed. <laughs> Diana cooked food for us in amazing amounts and unbelievable quality. That food was so good. And I could eat as much as I wanted, really, because I was wearing armor. <laughs> so it didn't matter. And I did. But something else really essential that Diana did was she put she created a room darkening tent. We were getting down to the wire and we did we had tents, but they weren't the kind that had sides on them. It would be Anne Marie working away on a piece of costuming and Diana fixing a, a tarp that was a cloth tarp that needed to be moved to make sure that cameras didn't get wet. And Diana's like, I got it. And then Jane was officially our production assistant and Jane is definitely a person that you want in a room when there's a stack of things to get done and you have no idea what you need to tackle first. Jane can look at the list and go, yeah, we should take care of this. I will also say that Jane's husband brought some incredible food for us. That was amazing. Man, they can cook. On this production, we were so very fortunate that Michael had arranged with, with Arthur and Tracy to have us stay with them in their home. Arthur and Tracy are quite the pair of personalities. I just remember the, f the very first night, I mean, the very first night we got there, Arthur welcomed us and showed us around town. Tracy was at work. Uh, she is a nurse. Living with Arthur and Tracy and also Louie and, and, and Phoebe, uh, their dogs, when we would come back from set, Phoebe was there at the gate waiting for me and eagerly wanted me to sit down on the couch. And the moment I sat down on the couch, Phoebe would leap up onto the couch, up onto my lap, climb up my chest and just go to town, just just licking my face and something about my, my beard. I don't know what it was. That's one of the things I, I most fondly remember is, is, is Phoebe welcoming, welcoming me and Jake back to the house because she didn't do it to Jake. She, she paid attention to Jake and, you know, but I was her favorite. At our AD, Anthony, I, 
incredibly dedicated to every aspect of this project. Unbelievable. So, so great to work with. And, and we always knew, like he was on top of it. He was, it was, he was in control. And again, that's really comforting. So, so the things that stuck out were, that resonated well beyond um, the production afterwards, like Alex's and Jacob's little figurine that he left us and gave each cast member. We each got our own little figurine that represented our troop. So one day when we were working on props, um, I, I got this idea to 3D model um, a design for the Broken Swords logo since uh, we had Cobra Squad and Vulture Squad. And I was trying to think of a cool thing for them to have. And I thought of like this idea of a cobra, with a, but when you turn it around, it's a skull. And I did the same thing with the Vulture. And Michael liked those and we wanted replicas of the pieces. So I went to my friend Jacob who does 3D printing and he printed them out for us. There's one person in particular that also helped get me to this point, and that's my lovely wife, who is also a producer. <laughs> uh, yeah. I hate to say this, but that applause should be a whole lot louder. <laughs> Krista's kind of an angel. She really is. Anywhere Krista is, there's an aura of peace and calm. And it could be such a hectic day with it, when we're doing one of those scenes with like the entire cast and the place is hopping and they're so like tight deadlines and we're trying to get through all this stuff. And then there's Krista and she just, and she's like this little safe bubble. Krista kind of was the glue that kept everybody moving all around. And when she wasn't doing that, she was sitting down assisting, you know, hair and makeup, props, everybody. Ah, oh, Krista, I love Krista. She is amazing. Um, she, uh, I have a story about her. So when I first got to set and I first met Sister Krista, I was, oh my goodness. I, I, I was like, oh my God, she looks like my sister-in-law. And she acts like my sister-in-law. And it's like, oh, is it my sister-in-law? No, no, it's not my sister-in-law, it's Krista. I have a tremendous amount of respect and admiration for Krista. So just having her around and knowing that, you know, she was an ear if you needed to talk, if you were concerned about something, or um, if you came in, you were like, maybe not, I don't know, feeling great for whatever reason. Like, Chris is there, you can just talk to Krista and it's gonna be okay. Yeah, just watching people, just watching the whole process and, and that's just, yeah, sometimes the words, it's just such an emotional feeling, just a feeling of such happiness of being involved with something that I knew was taking a whole lot of work by a whole lot of other people that I was being a part of, being involved in something that was so much bigger than, than my little world was was absolutely amazing. And just seeing everybody work so well together. There was one morning that I got there before anybody was awake. And like, I, I got there before any lights were on or anything was happening. And I was like, I didn't think I was this early. But I guess when everybody arrives, like things happen quickly. So I just like the extra planning of a window. So I got there and I was like, okay. I tried to open the door, it was locked. Anthony, the AD comes up, he unlocks it. He was like, oh, good morning. He was like, what, what are you doing here? I was like, I thought, I mean, <laughs> he was like, okay, just come inside. So then I started making a cup of coffee and things, but I was hungry because I woke up and got there so quick. So I was going into the fridge and I was gonna see if I could just find some like leftover casserole or something to heat up and I pull out this Tupperware and it just says on it hobnails vomit <coughs> and I was like I'm just gonna put this back inside <laughs> 
most memorable moment. <laughs> a moment in the two weeks that uh, really will forever stand out to me was it's a scene between Hobnail and Top, and we're talking about um, what's going to happen next, like what the next move is. And it's very intimate between the two of them. Hobnail, in the whole movie, you don't think she really cares. Every character has, has a little beef with her, and she has beef back, and you're like, she's there, but she's just kind of standoffish. But this is the one moment, in my opinion, in the whole script where you see that she does care. Let's walk away from this damn stupid war in this damn stupid country while we still can. Just us, Vulture and Cobra. Such an important part of her character that you realize she does care. She does care about these people, you know? She doesn't want to see them die either. She doesn't want to see, she doesn't want to have another teammate that doesn't show back up the next day. It was a moment between Dante and I that I just, it, it, it's my favorite line, and I have it on my bedside, and underneath is a little tab that I wrote that says, just us, Vulture and Cobra. Nobody knows this, but during the, I believe, 17 days when we were filming, um, I kept a, a little mini journal that I wrote in my phone for each of the days, um, from the day I got there to when we wrapped. Each day I wrote down day one, day two, day 11, whatever, on highlights of the day, very uh, specific, uh, sorry. Um, very, very um, specific interactions of cast and crew, and um, I actually, I, I, it's been about a year since I've looked at it, but it, um, I wanted to highlight things that were really important at that time, and I always want to remember them. Yeah, I, I never told anyone this until now. Um, I think my, my immediate family knows that I did that. It was actually my, my dad's idea. It's like, yo, you should keep a journal. It's like, I don't want to do that, you know? But I did, and uh, yeah, a, a lot of them are private moments, special moments, intriguing moments, secretive moments. So, yeah, and it's right in my pocket. So one of the things that made Broken Swords completely different from any project that I've been on um, is the sense that after I've done the pre-production, I've shot it, we've done post-production, it's been released, um, this is the first project that has had such a butterfly effect, such a uh, an echo through through my life. Um, and oddly enough, it has been something that uh, started as kind of like an inside joke on the set. Where's Weimarch? Weimarch the Red. Be missed. But one of the ongoing jokes was that I matched the description that I was Weimark the Red and the reason why I had the die was because I couldn't shoot the film and be in the film at the same time. So I just had the die. They had to write me off so I could make the film and shoot it and be the director of photography. It perpetuated through the entire 15 day production. So much so that by the end of the production when we were going to shoot something very similar to our poster back here, we were gonna have us all line up in front of this massive bonfire. The Easter egg in the poster was that there was going to be all of the Broken Swords unit and, and including Judge. So if you did a head count, you would count 13 people so that Weimarck would be in the, in the poster. I think the most challenging thing for me was figuring out and working within the constraints of the armor. It really affects the way you move. I never knew completely how, like, I, the scene was going to work with the armor, whatever we were going to do in the scene, until we started rehearsing. And then Michael and I would just have to figure stuff out because I just wasn't able to do it in the armor. And there was a, there was a lot of creative uh, thought that went on uh, around that. And I, I remember... I had to plan when I went to the bathroom because it took a solid 15 minutes for me to get out and then get back in. And, and I had to make sure that there were people who weren't busy because it took at least two people to get me out of it. And also they had to have a special seat for me. <laughs> we had this little stepladder. <laughs> 
<laughs> because, um, like the back of the armor had to hang off the back. Anyway, I had to like straddle this little step ladder. Anyway, I felt like, um, I felt a little bit like a diva because I, I had to have all this special attention because I just, I couldn't dress myself. I also felt really badass in that armor. So, um, you know, quirks and all, uh, it was, it was pretty awesome. <laughs> Teaching two actors who had never shot a bow in their life how to use them, not hurt themselves, and actually look like they knew what they were doing and they were expert marksmen when they were shooting. That was, that was fun. It was, it might have been the second time that I, uh, was actually practicing shooting it, besides like in high school and in gym class. Besides from that, I never had this much experience with bow and arrow. And I always, when we, we see films and, and TV and, and movies of people shooting like, oh, we're going on a castle siege and stuff like that, they always would shoot the bow up. We always shot it straight ahead to the target. He was learning, I was instructing him on how to shoot. He was shooting down, shooting down. He had this odd, little lean that he liked to do, but that was okay. I remember uh, Gio and Maxine um, practicing their, uh, their archery skills on some hay bales in the backyard in between takes. And then all of a sudden his bull was pointing straight up. I shot it up. I don't know the, the angle, but it was upwards, you know, head level up. And, I, and then I shot, I was like, this is gonna go pretty far, but I wanted to make sure I didn't go over the fence in the backyard. Wasn't so fortunate. I let it go and I was like, oh, that did go far. And I forget where it landed or I forget what he specifically did. And I just remember saying like, Gia. Mm -mm. No one knew, no one ratted on me. Uh, I said to the one, one person, he, uh, I was like, that was, uh, sorry, that, that was really stupid. I won't do that again. He was like, yeah, let's, let's, let's not. That was kind of bad. But um, I learned from that. And I just want to see how far it would go because everyone's always shooting the bows up. It's like, well, that's going to make, that's going to make some range there. So. We were talking about one of the things we wanted to do was have like, say like a graphic novel that was going to be the precursor to the film or the last panel uh, of the graphic novel would be the first frame of the film. And the idea was that, well, this would show the battle, so we have to see Weimark the Red. And so I had the honor of essentially being immortalized because uh, Michael decided that we would have to model Weimark the Red after me. I, I kind of just took that and just ran with it. Like I was, I was very into the idea of uh, being Weimark the Red, so much so that in the beginning of 2020, uh, I entered the world of uh, streaming, uh, video game streaming on Twitch. Well, when you do that, you have to have some kind of username, persona, or otherwise. So I thought to pay tribute to Broken Swords, I changed my gamer tag to Weimark the Red. And so then when I fast forward to 2020 and I decide I'm going to start streaming, I'm like, well, my gamer tag's Weimark the Red, but this is a completely different arena. This is something else entirely. This is a almost a public persona that's going to be put out there on the internet. So let me make sure it's okay. So I reached out to Michael and he thought it was a fantastic idea that Weimark the Red could exist in flesh and blood and in ones and zeros uh, on the internet and out in the world. And thus, uh, behind me, you'll see that there is Weimark the Red. I took my pirate persona in Sea of Thieves, handed it off to a graphic designer who created that uh, that logo after after Weimark. And so now I've been streaming since uh, the end of April of 2020 uh, on Twitch uh, as Weimark the Red. Uh, I'm, a, I've, I'm a Twitch affiliate streamer. I've got a great community behind me. And now there's people who only know me as Weimark the Red. They don't know Sean Schaefer, the cinematographer. Uh, they know Weimark the Red, whether that's Weimark the Red, the gamer, Weimark the Red, the streamer, Weimark the Red, the pirate on Sea of Thieves. I have come to embody Weimark the Red, and now people <laughs> know me as Weimark the Red. So to say that Broken Swords has had uh, a lasting impact on me would be a, a gross understatement. 
I remember, I don't know what he did or how it happened, but Dante tore the back of his pants. And so I quick grabbed a needle and thread, ran on the set, and pulled him close to me. I was sitting on a chair, a low chair, because his butt had to be right about here. And I was quickly sewing up where it had ripped, and the whole time trying to gently move his bottom so that I wouldn't prick him with a needle. He just looked so like... I messed up. <laughs> Looked so dejected in it because he was just standing there and Anne Marie sitting behind him and just sewing and she's got this smile on her face. And everybody was laughing so hard because I'm trying to sew him up without hurting him. And you could tell the poor guy was so embarrassed because he was blushing. It was so cute to see Martel blush. It just all kind of like just kept going. Just it's like the dream kept continuing. Like this is this is awesome. Like I'm dressed really cool, got, got, you know, to play this cool character. This is, you know, I'm working with other actors that are totally into this. You know, obviously your actor's into this. And the time, like, I never thought about the time. I never thought about any of that. Like, none of that mattered. Like, the length of time on set, wearing, I don't know how heavy that armor was, but, it, you know, it was heavy armor. And it was just, it was just really a cool experience. And then, and then, of course, when the day came where it ended, it just it's sort of like you, you go back home, back to your regular life, and you had that, that lull in your life where you're just sort of missing it. You're like, oh, man, I want to I wanna wake up and be on set again, dressed like a badass, you know? <laughs> Once we were in production, that moment that really stood out to me was the scene where we're at Switch's funeral and Buttercup gives a eulogy to Switch. I remember how quiet and intimate of a scene it was for Switch's funeral. And everyone just shoved into, into Abby and um, everyone that had a sword, you know, had it up and all the, their tips were touching everything like that. That moment stays with me. I mean, we're three years removed from shooting it and I still feel it. When I watch the film, I still feel that scene. I'm still there in Chop Shop uh, with Rebecca as Buttercup giving that eulogy. I had the wonderful experience of the burial scene where I got to make eye contact and connect with every single actor in that, in that scene. And I know I keep talking about gifts, but I really do feel like they were gifts. And I got to connect with everyone in that scene, and they're all amazing. What a, what a cool group of humans Michael assembled to take this journey. Um, and golly, I'll always be grateful that I was a part of it. But when it was finished, I went back to my theater professor from college and told him, guess what? I'm finally using my theater degree for what it should be used for. And Dr. Hazelp was so excited that I'm now doing something that I really, really love, and I was able to learn more. I couldn't believe how much I've grown from the beginning of the movie to the end of the movie in what also was really special and important to me. I was able to fund a theater scholarship specifically for techies that are working in technical theater or in technical movies, working on props or on costumes. And that makes me feel very proud and very excited because I feel like now I can give back and help someone else grow in the field that I so dearly love. So this movie is really a passion project for Michael. It's been a dream of his to make it basically his whole life. It was so wonderful to me to see just how amazing the time was for him on the set as a director. He is wonderful as a director. I'm a little biased, but seeing how he could bring all of the people together and help them contribute to the production themselves, but also bring it together in a cohesive way was really wonderful for me to watch. And just seeing his enjoyment, he could be up at five o'clock in the morning and go to bed after midnight and was happy all the way through the production, spending time directing. That was something very special to me. I think like, and I'll say it over and over again, like my favorite thing about the whole experience was the camaraderie that was built. But I think at the end of the day, working with everyone 
on a project that lasted that long. And we all shared an equal part. The most rewarding thing of the entire project for me was the friendships. The camaraderie that developed was, was fulfilling, was endearing, was, um, it was hard to, uh, you know, move away from that when, when it ended. I have time to sit up here and you won't have me or Kaylee, so somebody will have to, well, Kaylee's not in that scene, but I, and I'm not in that scene either. Never mind. Definitely one of the most rewarding things um, was being able to be in a group of people who are all just as dedicated and just as talented and just as willing to go for it as I was. I truly believe that everyone who was in Broken Swords at any point was ordained to be there. It was, it was beautiful from the cast to the crew to pre-production to post-production. You could not have asked for a better group of human beings. We were a team. We generally really cared for one another. And we were there day in, day out, and we just felt like a family. Learning people's stories and, and, and hearing where they came from, you know, their, their heartbreaks, their setbacks, their successes, I think allowed for and opened the door for a perfect storm of creativity, dedication, um, effort. I mean, there are so many tiny things that in, in each day, just from walking in and sitting in the makeup chair, which was a place of calmness before uh, the battle, really, getting dirty together you know, that bonds you. <laughs> I mean, I had, uh, you know, the makeup people knew my ticklish spots. And you, you go through that, even just that kind of minutia every day when you're on set and um, you can't help but kind of be tight. I gathered everyone twice to go to the bar in Hillsboro. I was like, let's go, like, let's go have a beer. Let's go like kick back and pull off some steam. It was a big group of us. It was, I think Shane and Karina and Alex and I may have gone together over there, but Tom was there, Jason was there, and uh, we all walked in, and it was one of those, like one of those scenes out of a movie where the, the stranger walks in and the club, the, the bar goes silent, and everyone just looks at you, and the guy just stands in the doorway for a bit before moving on, and every and life just continues on. And he thought it was really cool that the cast of a movie and the cast and crew of a movie were hanging out at his uh, at his bar. And I consider, like, as corny as it sounds, like I really do consider myself part of the Broken Swords family because everyone in the cast and crew, like, I genuinely have love for. One of my favorite, like, low-key favorite people on this was our armorer. Todd was just great. He was just absolutely great. Everyone was just amazing, and I really do believe that that's the reward that we got, you know? Um, the way that everyone treated each other, it, it was just special. It was very special. That was one of the best two weeks of my life, and I really wanted to work on this project some more because I thought the world was fascinating. I thought it was, I, don't know, I just had fun. I liked the pe working with Michael, and for a couple months afterwards, I was just like, damn, I wish. I wish we could do more of this. And then, lo and behold, one day Michael calls me up and he's like, hey, Alex, you want to animate the wall breaker and some other stuff for me? We're going to shoot some scenes outside of the barn. And I was like, yes, more. It was just so genuine. Everything from cast and crew, and then it spilled into our characters. And I mean, you can do as much prep work and dive into your character as much as you want. But like to actually be clicking with those people in and out of character is just the most real and grounding feeling. And I think that camaraderie carried both me and Whisper through the production. One very special, warm memory for me is when the cast was filming 
in the back of the barn. The actress had to be doused with water. At each time that we had to break, I would go up and just hold her because she was so cold. And she'd whisper in my ear, thank you so much. These different moments when you're talking to an actor, like when I was speaking with Kaylee, they would just lean over into my ear and say, thank you. And that meant so much. And I felt so much a part of this group that I wasn't, oh, just the props person or, oh, somebody that put together their costumes. I was part of their family that they cared about. And the love and attention that I gave them meant something to them and to me. And I think I might even tear up over that. All right, uh, uh, go out there and guess where everybody is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Buttercup. <laughs> So we all built up a really good camaraderie that whole time, you know, and that's cool. That's like, a, that's a rare thing. When you really walk away from a film and everyone's still connected, it's, it's sort of nice. It's, it's like you, you got that secondary family thing, movie family thing. Best set I've been on. Seriously. The, uh, the, I, it's honestly, it, it, it was the most professional set I've been on. And I always try and instill in the people I'm working with and uh, you know, and and trying to create for for my clients is just a certain kind of camaraderie, you know. Um, always invest in the projects, but I really try try and invest in the relationships too. One of the special memories that I hold from the Broken Swords was realizing kind of at the outset, like that culture and like that value and that atmosphere, those relationships, that was already like part of this. It was like embedded in this project, and I can totally credit that to to the people that really were working on the project before me, you know, during, during shooting. And it was really cool to see, you know? So, I mean, when Michael came in and, you know, the studio, you know, it just felt like family, you know? And, and later, you know, in the post process, we brought in Kelly and Gio for some ADR and you could see, you know, the two of them and Michael, and it just felt, you know, like, you know, the people that you've been working with and had known and had been friends with for so long. Um, and that just means the world to me when, when I can, you know, be working in projects like that. I mean, who wouldn't want to be working with people that you know you feel so fondly about, right? And all of these people came together and worked so hard, conquered a lot of trying circumstances, came up with workarounds, showed up, were present, did a fabulous job. We really created some camaraderie behind the scenes that was really special to me. I wanted everybody to have a great experience making the film, not just make a great film, but be able to walk away from the film, being able to say that was a wonderful set to be on, a wonderful production to be a part of. And that's probably the most meaningful thing to me is knowing that many people told me that at the end of the production, that this, this was a great group of people to be with and that they were treated really well uh, as a part of the production. So that is it. That's the story. It was an absolute privilege to work with every single individual that helped to make this dream come true. No matter what the future may hold, all of these people will always remain members of the Broken Swords family. A ragtag group of individuals from all walks of life, a lot like the characters in the film. I just have one last thing to say to each and every one of them. My honor is your honor. Broken swords forever. 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 Broken swords forever.